Hello there, it's your friend Phil, Project Management Trainer and Coach. Today, we're going to be covering the 49 processes of the PMBOK Guide 6 edition. You've got that table that breaks down the processes into process groups and knowledge areas. We're going to be covering it from top down in columns, and then we're going to be moving all the way from initiating to closing. So let's start with initiating. Process 1, Develop Project Charter. In initiating, the first thing that happens is the development of a project charter that authorizes the project, that identifies the project manager, and is authorized by a sponsor or initiator. It's a document that authorizes the project. Process 2. Identify stakeholders. The next process in initiating is the identify stakeholders process. In the identify stakeholders process, the project manager carries out a stakeholder analysis to better understand the stakeholders, to better understand their level of influence, their level of impact, to understand those that have a high level of power or a low level of power, those that have a high level of influence and a low level of influence, those that are not interested in the project and those that have a high interest. And this is where the PM begins to identify these stakeholders and their needs. Let's move on to the planning process group. The planning process group is a very important one. This is where the big master plan is developed. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's why one of the first things we want to do here in this process group, we want to develop a roadmap, a plan for how the entire project will be managed. And one of the things that happens on a lot of projects is changes. So right off the bat, while this is still in its infancy, we want to define how changes will be made to widgets, to plans, to documents, to various aspects of the project. Let's talk about the first process in planning. It's called Develop Project Management Plan, Process three in the PMBOK guide, going from top down in columns. So the first thing we do is come up with a skeletal, as it were, project management plan. And this gives us guidance in a uniform way how to plan all the subsidiary plans, how to manage changes to project artifacts, to project documents, to project drawings, and so on. This is where we think about a change management plan and a configuration management plan. But this is not a one-time event. This is an iterative thing. We incrementally are going to add to the project management plan throughout this process. We're going to incrementally add a scope management plan, incrementally add a scope baseline, a schedule management plan, a schedule baseline. And you're going to see all of these processes come to life as we move along. Let's go to our next process, process four in the PMBOK guide, going down across the process groups. Plan, scope, management. The next thing to think about here is plan, scope, management. In this process, a major goal is to define how we're going to manage scope, how we're going to define scope to start with. So it's a plan that gives us guidance on how to do many things. Think about it. If you are about to embark on a knowledge area, one of the first things that you should do is plan how you're going to carry out all the processes in that knowledge area. So in scope management, in the first process, we plan how to carry out all of the processes in scope. We also have a requirements management plan from this process that guides us on how to collect requirements which takes us to process five, collect requirements. We want to collect all the requirements, business requirements, technical requirements, functional requirements, and so on, to get a good understanding of what the stakeholders want, of what the customer wants. Process six, define scope. Once we understand what the customer wants, we need to define the parameters of the project. We then have a better idea of what is in the project and what is not in the project. What by default needs to be done to get to that end game, that end state that we're looking for? We call that define scope. 
So we want to define inclusions, exclusions, deliverable description, deliverable acceptance criteria, and so on. And we can put all of this into a document called the Project Scope Statement. Process 7. Create WBS. The next process is create WBS. Now, if you haven't seen a WBS, it looks like a family tree, but it shows how the project scope is decomposed into lower levels of detail. Google the term WBS to get a better idea of this. Process eight, plan schedule management. The next thing that happens in planning is plan schedule management. This is where we put together a plan for how to manage the schedule on the project. This is how we put together an idea for how to define the activities, sequence the activities, estimate the durations, and put the whole schedule together. So the plan schedule management process guides us on how to create that schedule. A lot of times people go into MS Project and they begin to whack in activities and create a schedule ad hoc. But in the world of the PMI, we need to be intentional about the how. How are we going to get the activities defined? Will that be with team effort? Will the PM do that with one or two team members? How are we going to sequence them? Which relationships will we use? Which tolerances do we need to be aware of in the schedule and so on? Process nine, define activities. The next process here is define activities. This is where you create an activity list. It does not have to be in order. We take our work breakdown structure work package and we break them open from the larger buckets of, let's say about 80 to 320 hours and smaller projects, maybe even eight hours. But we want to take those buckets of work packages and we want to break them down into smaller pieces, maybe activities of one hour, half an hour, two hours, three hours, and so on. And that's define activities. Now, this doesn't have to be in order. In the next process, we'll put it all in order. Process 10, sequence activities. The next process is called sequence activities. And this is where we employ start-to-start -start relationships, finish-to-finish -finish relationships, or even start-to-finish relationships to join those activities. Every predecessor should be linked to a successor, except it's at the end of a project. And we want to make sure that at the very beginning of the project, it is indeed the beginning of the project with the right relationships and the right dependencies. Speaking of dependencies, this is where we discuss mandatory dependencies, discretionary dependencies, internal dependencies, and external dependencies. Process 11, estimate activity durations. And that takes us to estimate activity durations. Because based on the resource needs and based on the parameters, you are then able to estimate how long it will take you to work those 50 hours, so to speak. Are we talking about 50 hours worked in a work week by two people, one person, 10 people? Or are we talking about 50 hours that needs to be spanned across several months because of the nature of tests being done on a particular project? because we need to wait for certain lab results to come back and so on. So it really depends on the project. Process 12, develop schedule. This process is where you get all of the information that you've assembled so far from define activities all the way down to estimate activity durations. And you put that together into a schedule that has a start date and an end date for all the activities and the project as a whole. Process 13, plan cost management. Now, this does not happen in strict rotation in a linear fashion. You could already have thought about your budget earlier on. Much earlier on, even when you were still in the bidding cycle of things, but in plan cost management, this is where you plan how to estimate and budget. Now, in plan cost management, we could think about tolerances plus 5%, minus 5%, and what have you. We could also think about the estimating approaches to estimate the activities. Process 14, estimate costs. In this process, estimate costs is governed by the cost management plan and output from the process we just talked about. Now we estimate 
how much each activity would cost. And then in the next process, we roll this up into a final amount called the budget. Process 15, determine budget. So in determine budget, we are determining the entire budget for the project. Process 16, plan quality management. Something else to think about as you plan is quality. So in plan quality management, this is where we identify the quality standards that need to be adhered to on the project, and the output of that is a quality management plan. Process 17, plan resource management. The next process, plan resource management, is where you put together a resource management plan that guides the project manager and the team for how to acquire the resources, human, equipment, materials, supplies, and even facilities. So it's a plan for how to do those things. Process 18, estimate activity resources. In this process, this is where you ask the question, what kind of effort are we talking about? Okay, that will take 50 hours of effort. How many people do you think you need to do that? What skill level are you looking for to be able to do that within that time period. Process 19, plan communications management. The next process is plan communications management, where the project manager thinks about what to communicate, why, how, when, and to whom. Process 20, plan risk management. In this process, the project manager and the team need to plan for uncertainty that could impact the project. How are we going to manage uncertainty? So, the how is documented in a risk management plan, and then we execute that plan by identifying risks, our next process. In identify risks, you want to identify those negative risks or threats, and you also want to identify positive risks or opportunities that may be available. You identify these risks, and then you go into the next process where you qualitatively analyze risks. Process 22, perform qualitative risk analysis. In qualitative risk analysis, your main aim is to rank the risks from top to bottom, and ranking could be quite subjective. You could rank the risks in terms of how probable you think they could be, or you could rank them in terms of how impactful you think they could be. Or you could hybridize that by multiplying, for example, on a scale of 1 to 5. What's the probability? It's a 3. On a scale of 1 to 5, what's the impact? It's a 4. 3 times 4 is 12. You get a risk score. And then you do that for all the risks to rapidly rank them. But again, you need to think about risk urgency. We call that a risk urgency assessment. What do we really need to take care of today? If we don't take care of it, it could grow worse and worse and will be in an even worse state than ever before. There's also a new term called risk propinquity. How much do stakeholders care about this risk? We also think about risk proximity. How close is this risk to actually causing damage on the project? Process 23. Perform quantitative risk analysis. This is where the project manager and the team should quantitatively analyze the risks from a dollar perspective or from a resource hour perspective or some other quantitative measure. Typically, it's probability times impact, probability in terms of a best guess or in terms of expert judgment, if you wanted to call it that, times the impact. The impact that you foresee would occur in terms of dollars. And then you come up with what we call the risk magnitude or the expected monetary value, EMV. EMV, expected monetary value, is equal to risk probability times risk impact. Process 24, plan risk responses. In this process, this is where the project manager and stakeholders plan responses to the risks that have been identified. Process 25. Plan procurement management. All you need to think about in procurement management is what do we need to purchase? Do we need to procure any services or goods 
from an external firm? Do we need to purchase supplies? Do we need extra help? This is where you plan how to do it. The contract types involved and how you would carry out the entire procurement or contracting process. Process 26, still in planning, plan stakeholder engagement. And it's the final one in planning. In plan stakeholder engagement, this is where you plan how to keep your stakeholders engaged, who you've already identified. You may decide to have certain meetings or certain face-to-face -face engagement with these stakeholders. In plan stakeholder engagement, you develop a stakeholder engagement plan to engage your stakeholders in a proactive and meaningful fashion. This is where you also use the stakeholder engagement assessment matrix. Let's move on to our next process group here, the executing process group. Moving on to executing, this is where we take all of the plans that we've just created and we put those plans into action. But bear in mind that all of those plans are going to funnel back into one place called the project management plan. So this is where we really begin to carry out those different components that we've identified. Process 27, direct and manage project work. In this process, we integrate all of the aspects of the project that pertain to executing the work. And this is where theoretically your deliverable comes from. And theoretically, this is where your work performance data is gleaned. And also, this is where the issue log is developed. Your work performance data is a big output of this process. It becomes an input to lots of processes in the monitoring and controlling process group. Work performance data is really your raw observations about the project. But raw observations are no good and they need to be analyzed. However, it's important to glean the data and it's important to create those deliverables. So direct and manage project work is a rather important one. Process 28, manage project knowledge. In manage project knowledge, we do need to consider the two types of knowledge, explicit knowledge, which is easy to codify, but difficult to contextualize and tacit knowledge, easier to contextualize than it is to codify. Project managers and teams should seek to obtain this knowledge from experts who possess it. Also provide a conducive trust-based environment and a forum for sharing knowledge, such as communities of practice, networking events, coaching, mentoring, and other opportunities to interact and learn in an environment conducive for knowledge sharing. Manage project knowledge deals with the managing, generation, capture, exchange, usage, and archiving of such useful knowledge. Lots of this knowledge can make its way into the lessons learned register for use on other projects. Process 29, manage quality. The next process here is manage quality. This is where the project manager and the team should be checking the process, ensuring that work is going according to plan being carried out the right way. Third-party quality audits are also a reliable means of conducting this process. Quality audits can be enforced and the results of such audits shared to better the team's chances of project success. Questions are asked such as, what are we doing well? What aren't we doing so well? And what can we reuse on the project or in the firm? Process 30, acquire resources. In this process, the project manager and the team are engaged in acquiring resources, human equipment, materials, supplies, facilities from other functional managers, other stakeholders, or external to the firm. Process 31, develop team. In develop team, this is where the project team gets trained, coached, mentored, developed. This is where we talk about team building, we talk about off-site seminars and so on, but the key goal is to equip the team with the skills they need. This is where we try to get the team to synergize and work together to deliver the final product of the project. Process 32, manage team. Think about feedback, because this process is all about feedback. 
giving the team constructive feedback to help them move ahead, making sure that the team has really gleaned something from the training or mentoring exercise. For example, you sent Phil for training, and if Phil learned nothing, then he's not performing well. This is where you need to rethink about sending Phil for more training or doing something different to help him out. Process 33, manage communications. The next process here is manage communications, and this is where you are actively communicating with stakeholders on the project through meetings and so on. Process 34, implement risk responses. So you've planned your responses. Well, this is where you carry out the responses. This is where you are actively executing your planned risk responses with risk owners and risk action owners taking ownership for actions they need to take to curtail, contain, or avoid risks. This is a practical hands-on process to transfer, avoid, mitigate, accept, share, enhance, exploit, and escalate risks. Process 35, conduct procurements. The next process here is conduct procurements, and in conduct procurements, your major goal is to carry out that bidding process by having bidder conferences, by reviewing the proposals that were sent in and ultimately selecting a seller and signing a contract with them. Process 36, manage stakeholder engagement. Last but not least in executing, we have manage stakeholder engagement. And this is where the project manager and the team are actively involved in executing the plan to keep stakeholders engaged. This is where you're having those face-to-face -face interactions and making sure that the stakeholder is aware of what he or she needs to be aware of. Part four, monitoring and controlling. The monitoring and controlling process group. Now going to the next process group, it's monitoring and controlling and process 37 is our first one here. It's called monitor and control project work. This is an integrative process where you make sure you are integrating all the moving parts on the project to ensure that the project as a whole is well monitored and controlled. From this process, you obtain work performance reports, a very important output. Process 38, perform integrated change control. This is where change requests are reviewed. This is where you would review all of those change requests with a group of people known as the Change Control Board. The Change Control Board reviews the change requests and they call the shots as to whether the change should be approved, rejected, or put on pending status. Ultimately, you get a change log from this process that documents everything. Process 39, Validate Scope. In Validate Scope, the customer, the customer, the customer, this is customer focused because the customer is the main actor. This is where the customer inspects the deliverable that has been sent, or should we say the verified deliverable that has been found to be fit for use by the performing organization. Now, the performing organization have a responsibility to ensure that the inspected deliverable is good to go to the customer. First of all, we internally inspect a deliverable, and then we externally inspect a deliverable from the customer's perspective. So this is where the customer would validate that, in fact, the entire scope, the requirements, and what was needed is indeed inherent in the deliverable. Process 40, control scope. Have you ever heard about gold plating? adding extras that are not needed and were not authorized? Well, in control scope, this is where the project manager ensures that no one is adding extras. Absolutely no one. No one is gold plating and there's no scope creep. And if there is, if someone's trying to add extras, those extras, those requests must be funneled through the perform integrated change control process that we just talked about. Now, it's not uncommon to find opportunities to maximize a project and add extra benefits to the customer in risk management, but all of these have to be done in a coordinated fashion and not ad hoc or at random. Process 41, control schedule. In control schedule, the project manager and the team ensure that they are indeed on schedule. They make sure there are no delays 
And if there are change requests, then they must go through the right process, performing a graded change control. Process 42, control cost. This process is where the project manager is involved in controlling those cost expenditures to ensure that they are being spent on exactly what was identified, no more, no less. So there are many avenues for the PM to catch gold plating and to catch the project from going off track. Process 43, control quality. In control quality, the project manager and the team should be ensuring that the deliverable produced is fit for use and conforms to requirements through inspection. So in control quality, the project manager must aspire to check every way possible that that deliverable is good to go to the customer. And we talked about validate scope as in where the customer checks the deliverable for themselves. These two processes could actually be done in tandem. Check the work internal, send it to the customer the very next minute or the next day, or in parallel, in incremental chunks. Remember, the world of Agile is also talked about in the PMBOK guide, and you also need to think about doing this in an iterative fashion. Process 44, Control Resources. In Control Resources, the project manager and the team are involved in controlling physical resources. That's right, not humans, to ensure that the physical resources are available at the right time, in the right quantity and quality, and if resources are deemed inadequate or incorrect or unavailable, it's the job of the project manager to take the necessary action to realign the project with the plan, with the promise for those resources. Process 45, monitor communications. In monitor communications, the project manager and the team need to be aware of communications, how they have transpired, did they go according to plan? Have they been effective? Was the managed communications process good? Were the performance reports and the reporting method frowned upon by stakeholders? Or do they like how you communicate? If they don't, something needs to change. And if they do, keep things as they are or even improve them. Process 46, monitor risks. The next process, monitor risks, is where the project manager and the team are actively involved in checking to make sure that the risk response was relevant, to make sure that the risk response actually worked, to make sure that the reserves on the project are adequate. And also, they should be making sure that if there's anything that could be done better risk-wise, it should be done. And also, very importantly, the team should make sure that the risks in the risk register are the only risks that exist on the project. And if the project is exposed to new risks, then those new risks must be documented within this process of monitor risks. So there's quite a lot of activity that happens in this one. Process 47, control procurements. In control procurements, the project manager and the team should be ensuring that the vendor or the subcontractor are doing the right thing, following the plan. And if not, you must make sure that you steer the project in the right direction. Process 48, monitor stakeholder engagement. The project manager and the team should be involved in check-in to make sure that indeed the stakeholder is as engaged as he or she needs to be. The project manager should make sure that the plan is updated or modified according to real needs. The final process group, the closing process group, Close project or phase is process 49. This is where you close out either a phase in the project or the project as a whole. Ultimately, you get your transition for your deliverable. We call that the final product service or result transition. Make sure you don't release the team until they've given you all those artifacts that were promised. So that's the end of our review of the 49 processes of the PMBOK Guide 6th edition. Remember, if you're on a mission to get PMP certified, visit www.praizion.com. Come on board our online self-study course, which comes with phenomenal mentoring, 
coaching, training, and equipping. Thank you very much for the audience and all the best in your project management journey. Bye for now.